Welcome to the Abominations of Desolation in the Hall of it Discourse. And notice we said two. That's a hint for where we're going to go. This is Joseph Smith's Matthew, and that's actually where that comes from, the two. And Matthew 24 and 25, Mark 12 and 13, and Luke 21. And like I said, this is Lesson 21, and we actually have two different discourses in Luke and in Matthew. One's more of a private briefing to his apostles and disciples, and the other one's more of an open discussion. Anyway, that being said, take it away. I'm Farrell. And I'm Rhonda Pickery. (laughs) And here we go into one of the most loaded prophecy chapters in Scripture. Uh, This is exciting. This is prophetic stuff. Super cool chapter, yeah. Yeah, this is all the prophetic chapters about the end times, and I thought we should have named it the Abomination of Desolation, or the Abomination of Desolation. We could have, except for if we're going to do the Joseph Smith translation, we would have said the Abominations of Desolation. plural, too, because we had the one in 70 AD and the one to come. (laughs) So what we're going to be doing today is Matthew, Mark, and Luke are going to be in parallel columns, and the Matthew version you're going to be seeing a lot of Joseph Smith translation in that and a lot of reordering of the verses because we're actually going to be following Matthew 24 in the Pearl of Great Price, Joseph Smith Matthew, by adjusting what's in Matthew 24 in the Which, column. in essence, is adding another dimension to Right. It. So we're going to be picking up, you know, all four dimensions of, of the uh, Olivet Discourse which is not really completely the Olivet Discourse, as you mentioned before. The Luke 21 is actually at the temple when that is presented, and then he's going to recap that discourse on the Mount of Olives, and we'll show you that in just a minute. Right here in Mark, you can see that in Luke... Verse 1, it says, He looked up and saw the rich men casting in their gifts into the treasury. So you can see here, he's at the temple in Luke. And then going back to the last couple of verses in Matthew 23, that Jesus is on the Mount of Olives and that he's weeping over Jerusalem and that he's saying that they would not see him henceforth until they are acknowledging him in the clouds of heaven and he is glorified and crowned on the right hand of God. So the setting is different right out of the gate in Matthew 24 and and Luke Luke 21. 21. Mark is following what's going on in Matthew 24 and Luke 21 kind of stands on its own in some cases, in some verses. Now, again, you can see on the left-hand side, I, we're following straight through Joseph Smith Matthew in the Pearl of Great Price. And those references are noted on the, on the slides, but you'll also notice that the verses in Matthew 24 are going to be a little bit out of order because we are following it as it's recorded in the Pearl of Great Price. Now, the first thing that we need to... Uh, notice is that Jesus went out and departed from the temple in Matthew 24, and his disciples came to hear him saying, Master, show us concerning the buildings of the temple. So he's our, he's told them that the, that the temple is going to be destroyed in three days, and then it's going to be built again. And, and both um, in all the accounts, they're asking for him to answer questions about that destruction of the temple and the destruction of the Jews. Well, also the destruction in 70 AD. Right, which is um, which he's going to answer, just like he did in the parable of the Good Samaritan. He's going to answer both questions at once. He's going to answer both questions here. And, and so he, the first thing that they have asked him is they've asked him to show them concerning the temple. Um, and behold, you have said that the stones of the temple... Um, and, the, and the great buildings that are here are going to be thrown down. And Jesus left them and went on the Mount of Olives. You can see here in, in verse 3, and the disciples came to him privately. So again, we have a very public sermon at the temple in Luke 21. We have a very 
private Q&A going on with the disciples on the Mount of Olives. All right, so what we're going to do now, is before we start going through Matthew 24, is we're going to look at the questions, okay? What shall it be, uh, the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? That's in Matthew 24. Again, both questions are asked in both places. So here in Joseph Smith, Matthew 24, he's asked the questions, when will that destruction of the temple be and the Jews? And then what shall be the sign of thy coming? And, and we're going to go back to what Joseph Smith said about how to read parables. What Jesus is going to answer is very, very symbolic. And what Joseph Smith said is that the rule of interpretation is in order to understand what's being said, you have to clarify those questions. And now let's go ahead and be super clear about the questions here in Joseph Smith, Matthew chapter one, verses verse four, the, he says, tell us when, so our first question is about when, yep. and then our second question is about the signs. The, the when question is about when is there going to be the destruction of the temple and of the Jews that Jesus was talking about? And then they're going to ask him, what will be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? And of course, with the end of the world, are we talking about the end of the wicked at the beginning of the millennium when it changes into a paradisical state? Or are we talking about the end of the world at the end of the millennium when the earth is transfigured at that point. So Joseph Smith has clarified it and said, when it's the end of the world is the destruction of the wicked that's at the end of the world. Of the 6,000 years. So exactly, that would be the when the wicked basically have to go into, the, in the scriptures, that's a time when they're cut off if they don't repent. And it's a time when they get they go into a time out. And so we're talking about the second coming of Christ at the beginning of the millennium, what are the signs of that? And then we're talking about when the destruction of the temple and the Jews, that one's going to be the 70 AD version, and then the other question is going to be the other layer of interpretation. Well, almost which is the restoration ending. of the Jews completely. Right. At the Mount of Olives right. when he sets foot there. Okay, so Luke 1, 21 is going to be talking about the destruction of the temple because, and I'll show you why in just a minute, it's more focused on the current events that are going on. And then Matthew 24 is going to be more focused on the end time prophecy. Yeah, more prophetic. And I'll show you why. All right, so Luke 21 is going to talk about the destruction of Jerusalem at that time and Matthew 24 is going to be talking about the destruction of Jerusalem prophetically in the end time. Although they both they both asked both questions, so they're both going to play with both questions, but the focus Almost in Luke... Almost overlapping answers. Yes. The focus in Luke is going to be before, and the focus in Matthew is going to be after. And the middle ground, the common ground for both of them, is going to be what's called the beginning of sorrows. And thus, we're back to Isaiah 46.10. I will show you the end from the beginning. He's kind of typing things. Here. Exactly. Exactly. So here we have Luke 21 and Luke, Matthew 24 in parallel columns. And I want you just to notice what the beginnings of sorrows here are that we're talking about. Let's let, We can kind of make a list. And I kind of tried to line them up so that you can see them in parallel. One of the first signs is that there's going to be deception. Some people claiming to be saving the world, false messiahs that will come. And there, some of them will say, I am Christ, actually. And they will deceive many. And we're told to go, ye not, therefore, after them, in both Luke 21 and in Matthew 24. And then you hear of wars and rumors of wars and see that you be not troubled. So we have deception wars and rumors of war nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom so this is m not just one country to war this is a worldwide warfare situation and then the last ones are famines pestilences and earthquakes 
in the Matthew 24 account and in the Luke 21 account, it says, and great earthquakes shall be in diverse places and famines and pestilences. Same thing, tiny bit different order. It's really, Matthew 24 is a recap of the sermon that he gave at the temple in Luke 21. With the added dimension. Right. And so <laughs> notice here in verse 8, this is super important. All of these things that we just listed are the beginning of I'm sorrows. Sorry, yeah. Okay? Now, in Matthew, the next verse says, then they shall deliver you up to be afflicted. So after these beginning of sorrow signs, we're getting the after story. After these, um, what, cosmic events and, and political events. Notice on the Luke account in verse 12, it says... But before all of these things, they're going to persecute you. And basically down in verses 20 to 24, it says Jerusalem is going to be compassed, encompassed around and that that will be a this is desolation. The Titus and yeah. the, and this the is kind of the Titus and the wrong thing. And as a matter of fact, it's so important here because when Titus surrounded Jerusalem, that was the signal. They knew that they had to flee. And there, there's scholars out there that, that emphasize that the Christians were not killed in the Roman destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD because of this warning because in they Luke got 21. They went to Pella. They went across the Jordan into Pella. And the, the warning was so that they, they could get out of Dodge, basically, right. in 70 A.D. But, again, we're going to have an end-time situation where Jerusalem is compassed about again. And we're going to look at that. And you can see that Matthew is going to go after the beginning of sorrows. And Luke is, okay, but before the beginning of sorrows. So you can see that they have a little bit different focus here. All right, so let's take a look at the signs that are called the beginning of sorrows. What do you have? They're all False listed. False Christ, right? wars, famine, pestilence, and earthquakes. And, and here's the fascinating thing. These are the exact same things that the seals in Revelation chapter 6 starts to are talking about. Yeah. And the four horsemen, there's going to be false Christs, war, famine, pestilences, and earthquake. And then again, um, there's going to be cosmic upheaval after that as well. You can see in all three of these end time accounts. So just notice that Matthew 24 and Luke 21 are actually paralleling Revelation 6 at that point as well. All right. So now going on, you can see here in Luke, in the actual text, there's the but before. And then I want you to notice the verse numbers in Matthew 24 here because the JST is going to change the verse order. And those beginning of sorrows items that were in Matthew uh, verses 5 and 6, you can see here that we've skipped 7, 8, and we've skipped some verses here because Joseph Smith has moved those verses into different areas of the um, Pearl of Great Price version here. You know, I, obviously that's fine because the prophecy is multi-layered. Right, and, so and he's almost hitting he, a different he's layer. He's hitting a different layer exactly. than, than the one that I was talking about right there. And, you know, you get a lot of flack from Christians saying, you know, well, the version of the New Testament is kind of indisputable. But once again, I wanted to hit Joseph Smith, we like to call it a translation, but truthfully, it's kind of an enhancement. It's not really a translation. He, a, I like the way they call it the inspired version, version right? It's, it's yeah. added depth of understanding. And some of the verses are actually revelation, whereas some of the verses are just clarifications Clarification. exactly. and, and things like that. So anyway, I, here is that verse in Matthew 24, 9, where it's going to pick up the then after the cosmic um, upheaval and the beginning of sorrows that we mentioned. Now, let's go ahead and get into verse 15, where we notice that Joseph Smith has in both the, the Mark account and the Matthew account changed abomination of desolation to 
abominations of desolation. So Pharaoh, I'll take just a minute and talk about the abomination of desolation in Daniel and how that applied in 70 AD and in the end time. Well, you almost have to go back to Antiochus Epiphanes. The abomination of desolation was a desecration of the temple, number one. But we almost are led to understand that in modern Let, interpretation, let's go and tell them how the abominations was. of desolation are abomination that desolates is a good way to put it. You want to go back to Antiochus Epiphanes? How he desolated it. Yeah, he put a statue of of Zeus he, in the Holy of Holies and desecrated the temple. And um, slaughtered a pig on the slaughtered altar. slaughtered a pig on the altar. So that was abomination of desolation. However, that's just a part of the end time picture. We have both a a desecration, but also a desolating events. Okay. All right. And so um, there's this abomination of desolation. We have an historical uh, type and shadow of it with Antiochus Epiphanes. We have a fulfillment of the Luke 21 warning in um, Roman, the Roman siege of Jerusalem. In 70 AD, AD yeah. and at that time, the the, all, the temple is destroyed and everything. Yeah. And so this is this was back to that original question that they were asking. And then, of course, in the end time, we can we can apply all this on a prophetic on a prophetic level. In the end time, there will be another abomination of desolation. In order to have an abomination of desolation, you actually have to have a temple. So obviously the end time abomination of desolation has not occurred yet because the um, in the type of Antiochus Epiphanes, you have to go to the Holy of Holies. And, you know, just like the New Testament s says that he will declare himself to actually be God. Paul yeah, tells and, us and that's laid out very clearly in Daniel 9, 27, -ish, where it says when it will take place in the midst of the week. Right. That final hour. Daniel's hour of judgment. And and one more thing before we leave the abominations of desolation is that you know the it's it's the the bad half of that pivotal event in the middle of Daniel's numbers that the numbers actually count to and from the abomination of desolation that event. And so it's really important to to be clear about what that is. Another translation is an abomination that depopulates, you know, Antiochus Epiphany slaughtered all the priests that, that wouldn't um, basically desecrate the temple. And this kind of thing will replay. And we'll look at a couple of those scriptures in a minute. And then notice that he says, when you see this, stand in holy places. And I think that's fascinating because, you know, in, in, the situation of Rome in 70 AD, they actually fled from Jerusalem. Right. So standing in holy places was going um, to Pella at that time. So well, it's I, gathering in almost a wilderness experience. So I, it's kind of, you have to ask yourself the question, is the place holy that you're standing in or is the is it because holy people are standing there that the place is holy? Yes. So you've kind of got that question to ask right there. And then over in Luke 21 at the temple, I want to, to notice these verses. It says, in your patience possessed ye your souls. Now this patience is a Keep your key composure. word in end time prophecy. For some reason, it emphasized over and over and over in scriptures, we will wait upon the Lord. We will be patient. We, you know, Jesus says, when I come in the end time, will I find faith? That, that implies that people are losing faith because he's not showing up when, when, they, when they hoped he would. thought their box. And I would link that to the half hour of silence. The patience of the saints is the half hour. It's, it's that time of persecution for the saints. Absolutely, and I'm actually going to link that up as well in just a minute. So here's a couple of here's a couple of reasons. Uh, here's a couple of verses that we have in the end time that talk about 
Jerusalem be encompassed with armies a second time. In Zechariah 14, for I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city shall be taken, and the houses rifled, and the women ravished, and half of the city shall go forth into captivity, and the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city, and the Lord shall go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. So, you know, when I, when I realized these things, when I realized that the mission of our brothers in Jerusalem is to put their lives on the line as a nation for freedom and for God, it, it just respect. blew me away, right? Yeah, new respect for the offering the Jews will make. A absolutely. <clears throat> And then in Joel chapter 3, it says, For behold, in those days and in that time, when I will bring again the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem, I will also gather all nations and will bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat. <coughs> and again, it's not good for the Jews here. And they will, I will plead with them there for my people and for my heritage, whom they have scattered among the nations. They've parted my land so there's going to be a big land deal thing going on there, as we've talked about before. And they have cast lots for my people and given a boy for a harlot and sold a girl for wine that they might drink. Again, there, the scriptures are pretty clear that there's going to be another abomination of desolation in the end time. And here, in both Matthew and Luke, they are told, and let them who are in Judea flee to the mountains so again this the you know we we often talk about us going out into the wilderness, wilderness experience yeah. but when you actually go through the literary structures that john is using um we find that chapters 11 and 12 are more about jerusalem and 10 and 13 we're doing a chiasm with 11 and 12 in the center here um are about the gentiles and the nations and so that woman fleeing into the wilderness is speaking of Judah. Judea needs to flee. And, you know, that kind of goes along with our, our Daniel's number chart that we've put together. And you see trees up there in that wilderness second journey. half because they have to flee at this time as well. Now, in Luke, notice that it, it has very... The, this, these two verses here in Luke carry a lot of linking words, so we need to read them carefully. For these be the days of vengeance. So it talks about not stopping to get anything. When you see it, you get out. Okay? Kind of like a lot thing. And Don't look back almost. Exactly, yeah. and that, that <clears throat> was super important because in the time of Titus, when he was besieging Rome, there was a death in Rome, and so Titus I had to go back to Rome and kind of pause the siege for a minute. And it was in that pause that they got out. And then he comes back and finishes the siege. So again, it's, it was important that they act and that they, and that they act quickly on, on the warning here. For these be the days of vengeance, that all things which are written may be fulfilled. But woe unto them that are with child, and to those that give suck in those days, for there shall be great distress in the land and wrath upon this people. So there were a couple of real key word. words there. Big words in here. What were they? Wrath and great distress. And then vengeance. Right. And vengeance. Now, the reason that vengeance is, is, is important is because of... Nazareth and what Jesus read there. We'll look at that in just a minute. But where he said I, in Isaiah 61, the spirit of my Lord Jehovah is upon me for Jehovah has anointed me to announce good tidings to the lowly. These are the words that he read in Nazareth, right? When he was right. who stood at the pulpit in the synagogue. Jubilee language, yeah. Right. And he has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted and proclaim liberty to the captives. And this is so beautiful because that's exactly what he's about to do at his crucifixion in the spirit world is to proclaim liberty to all the captives there. And to open the eyes of the bound and to herald the year of Jehovah's favor. And then, of course, that's the middle of verse 2. And Jesus, it says in Luke that Jesus closed the book and sat down. And the part that he 
didn't read when he said, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears, the part that he didn't say was the next sentence and the day of vengeance of our God and to comfort all that mourn. So this it, at the first coming, it wasn't the day of vengeance. But in the end time, the day of vengeance is when Christ returns. So again, these be the day of vengeance and the day of wrath. So let's take a look here. It says in um, Mark that there are great tribulations on the Jews and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem, such as was not before sent upon Israel. So this again is that period of time that, what did they call it in Daniel? The days of trouble like in no other. Right. Daniel days of 12. trouble. Two, I guess it is. First, pretty close. First one is, is one, <laughs> there. Guess. It is, and he's you're pretty good at Daniel. And he <clears> shall <throat> plant the tabern. This is uh, the very last verse of chapter eleven. And he shall plant the tabernacle of his palace between the seas in the glorious holy mountain. Again, we get this Antiochus Epiphanes type abomination, abomination of, of desolation. desolation, where he's in the temple and, and and claiming himself to be God. Yet he shall come to his end, and none shall help him. But at that time, Michael will stand up. So again, we have this great reversal here where Michael is standing at Adam on Diamond and the Antichrist or the king of Assyria in Isaiah is declaring himself God in, in the this temple, crossover event. In, in, the, in the palace between the seas in the glorious holy mountain. All right, and at that time Michael shall stand up, that great prince with sta which standeth for the children of thy people, and there shall be a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation, even to that time. Now that is your wrath. Yeah, that's your wrath. But then it says, and at that time thy people shall be delivered. So just like with the trumpets of judgment and the half hour of silence in Revelation chapter 8, and then the the half hour of silence and then a resurrection of the righteous in DNC 88, you have opposite things happening. You have a time of trouble since such but meanwhile. As, yeah, meanwhile, thy people are being delivered. Yep, the meanwhile. Same thing that happened in Rome in 70 AD. Thy people got out of Dodge, whereas it was a time of terrible destruction at Jerusalem for anybody that stayed. And then you can see here again in Daniel that in this end time event where the people are being delivered, there's a resurrection that takes place. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake. So let's look at another <clears throat> verse about this end time period, this wrath, this great tribulation. It says in Mark here, hail the Assyrian the rod of mine anger. This is Isaiah chapter 10. Um, we're using the Abraham Gileadi translation. This is just incredible because here, the Antichrist figure in Isaiah, the king of Assyria, he's being identified as God's wrath. So God isn't wrathful. He's not out there destroying everybody. No, he's just allowing the king of Assyria to do what he's going to do. He's, he's going to allow the Antichrist. Yeah, I was just going to continue with what you're doing so keep going all right and i will commission him against a godless nation and appoint him over the people deserving of what of my vengeance because this is the day of vengeance that, that we're linking this word all together and again i can't help but read that and think of glenn beck when we read that name and, oh <laughs> my like, word oh my word godless Does the nation. people deserving of my vengeance right and then again here we have our thief our end time thief to pillage for plunder, to spoilate for spoil, and to tread underfoot like mud in the streets. So um, this is that great wrath, that time of trouble, and we've identified the Antichrist as being the one behind that. Alrighty, taking a look at verse 8, it says, And these things which have befallen them are the beginning of sorrow. So here you can see that Joseph Smith moved this down to the beginning of sorrows in the end time, whereas up in Luke, the beginning of sorrows, um, but before, <laughs> it was the way it was situated in the Luke account. Now I love 
what Joseph Smith has added here in verse um, in verse 21, where he says that in the end time, none would be saved, but before the elect's sake, according to the covenant, their days will be shortened. So hmm. this time period in the end time, it says for the elect's sake, the days will be shortened. I love that Joseph has said according to the covenant. So in the Abrahamic covenant, the Lord told Abraham that his posterity would remain to the second coming of Christ. So no, how many, no matter how many people lay down their lives, no matter how many A people remnant, are definitely. persecuted and, and willingly stand <clears throat> for Christ, there will be a remnant. That they're, The goal of the evil side is to annihilate God's people. But God will never allow that to happen. For the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. And the Lord will step his foot on the Mount of Olives and take out an overwhelming international army that is encompassing Jerusalem again. And then he says, um, Joseph Smith adds, Behold these things I have spoken unto you concerning the Jews. So we're talking about the fall of Jerusalem here very clearly. Yeah, a lot of people like to say, oh, it's over here, but no, it's very this clear. This is the fall of America. Yeah, this is very clear talking about what's going on over in Jerusalem. And whenever you're looking at last days, the the time markers are all in Jerusalem, pretty much. Exactly. Now, different things are happening here, which you can find in Book of Mormon and Doctrine and Covenants, but the timeline Well, markers, you're about to find it right here in Luke yeah, as well. So it, That's why I say the time markers are all going on in the old world. Right. And so what now we're going to, Luke is going to say something about the Gentiles, which is uh, kind of a little scary for the Gentiles. It says, and they will fall by the edge of the sword and shall be led away. And then it says, and Jerusalem will be trodden down of the Gentiles. Until the time of the Gentiles be fulfilled. That's actually the scripture I was alluding to in the last class where it talks about when the time of the Gentiles comes to an end, is when Jerusalem is no longer trodden underfoot, which tells you the time of the Gentiles doesn't really come to an end until all of that. Yeah, and it, you know, they, they get crippled maybe a little bit at the fall of Babylon, which is um, at, at the time of Adam and Adam, and when the Antichrist makes his big stand there, he actually takes out the West, um, according to the scriptures. But, you know, the nation's, aren't completely taken out till the Mount of Olives because obviously the nations are the ones that are encompassing Jerusalem, Jerusalem yeah. in the end. And uh, of course, in Revelation 11, it also says that the courts, um, the two witnesses are protecting the temple proper, but the courts are being trodden down of the Gentiles at that time. And it's just the time of the two witnesses um, as well. And then notice that Again, we're going to see those, those scriptures about the false Christ and the deception. We're going to kind of go back to that in the next few verses. But um, what I'd like to do is kind of take what we've learned so far and kind of put it on the timeline. So, again, we learned that there, the beginning of sorrows is false Christ. I, I love the connection between the four horses of, right in Revelation the, the, six. Yeah, the false Christ being the white horse, mm -hmm. wars being the red horse, red horse, famine being the the black horse, and then death, and pestilence being the pale horse or the sickly green horse, and then and the, boom, then earthquakes. The rest of the of the uh, woes or the rest of the seals starting to get going. And it's, and it's pretty fascinating too if you read Revelation six verse twelve very carefully. It says that you know when there was the the great earthquake. And the time of wrath had come. It actually spells Times it out right end, there. Yeah. That's a time marker right there. But let's go ahead and put this on the timeline. So we've got the beginning of sorrows. Where is that going to be on the timeline? We learned that it was um, the famines and the earthquake and everything. I'm kind of putting it after the eclipse. You know, when we get that second warning... Yes. I, I kind of expect all of these things to start breaking out. 
Yeah. Start so really 2024, what, what's the date of the eclipse in 2024? April 8th. All right. And then that time of the Gentiles being fulfilled, we kind of already talked about that a little bit. That's, that's the Jerusalem is trodden down until that point. And then at that point after that, it's the kingdom of God, not the kingdoms of the nations anymore. And then we saw that the vengeance and the wrath that, that cuts loose at that crossover <clears throat> event, right? When the abomination of desolation. And this all ties in exactly with Daniel's numbers when, when you plot it all out. And then we also saw that the patience of the saints yes. was there. And so we, we have that during that half hour of silence. And if you watch that, that key word, I, I love what um, the Apostle John says, right, in chapter 1 of the book of Revelation. He says, I, John, who am with you in the patience of the saints. In tribulation. In tribulation, the way, yes. the way he says it. And, of course, he's translated, so that's a literal um, promise as well. All righty, so we kind of kind of put every, put the picture together so far from what we've been reading, and now we're going to be in verse 6. It says, and ye also shall, go ahead and read verse 6 for me. And ye shall also hear of wars and rumors of wars. Ye shall, or excuse me, see that ye be not troubled. That's tall order, right? Exactly. <laughs> so the, that's why I have that patience of the saying, be yeah. not troubled. You know, be not troubled. The world's falling apart. But, <laughs> exactly. But don't, don't be, be not troubled. troubled. <laughs> We got For all I have told you must come to pass, but the end is not yet. And I, I've said this a lot to a lot of people as as we talk about these things. And everybody says, oh, we've got to be halfway in tribulation, you know. Well, guess what, folks? The end is not yet. We always say you can still go to Costco, right? right? <laughs> I, I love this verse where it says that for the as the light of the morning cometh out of the east and shineth upon the west and covereth the whole earth, so will the coming of the Son of Man be. And that's a fascinating coming here. We're going to take a look at that's that kind in of just a, a minute. Which is... Well, it says, as the light of the morning cometh out of the east, that's that's a dawning, but also it's going to be, it shineth upon the whole earth, so everybody's going to be able to see it. Yes. Actually, Jonah Smith's going to talk about that a little bit. We're going to take a look at that. But before we leave this slide, um, we're going to also... Notice that we've got that cryptic passage that says, For where the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered. And I and I, I believe that that's a reference to Isaiah 40, where it says that they will run and not be weary and walk and not faint, and they will rise up on eagles' wings. Eagles' wings in the scriptures is an allusion to a translation, a translated state. It's, it's a righteous situation in Isaiah 40. Crazy stretch in there, but Ezra's eagle makes me wonder if if there's a bad side as well as yeah, a good well, side. It yeah, almost makes me wonder if it's the restoration of the principles. Oh, George of, Washington's of justice and of justice. George beautiful. Washington's dream that the light breaks forth and right. that the lion comes out of the wilderness. It's just it's just interesting to consider options. But. It's interesting. Um, it's also interesting that you know. If you're just going to go with uh, symbology here, an eagle would be a Gentile. But a because carcass. Because it, uh, it would not be um, something, an animal that could be offered in the temple, right? So these would be the righteous Gentiles. And the carcass, obviously, is a the death of the nation before exactly. the eagles gather. So it's like the, the death of Babylon in the West. Well, and, and here in the context of the patience of the saints... It's it's the gathering of the eagles and they and they're gathering and they're being slaughtered as well. So there's several different layers and and ways that the righteous are gathered. Well, and you got that. So likewise shall must must mine elect be gathered from the four quarters of the earth. Notice that that's happening after. Everybody wants to see this gathering take place, but it's actually happening after these things. Right. So everybody sometimes gets this out of order. This big gathering by the 144,000 is taking place after the death of right. the, and, bee, and of the, the and carcass. The, and the huge gathering before the start of the millennium happens after. Well, I would say at the beginning after. of the millennium. Yeah, that's what I meant. <laughs> the beginning of the millennium, after the Mount of Olives is what I meant to say, um, is, is, is because of 
Jerusalem has laid down their lives yes. to the point of death at that point. So that's the carcass there as well as the persecuted saints during the half hour of silence there. All right, so let's go ahead and take a look at what Joseph Smith had to say about that comet in the end time. He said, the dawning of the morning, so as the rising oh, the from starts. the east, right, makes its appearance in the east and moves along gradually, so also will be the coming of the Son of Man. We just read that. <clears throat> it will be small at its first appearance and gradually become larger until every eye shall see it. Shall the saints understand it? Oh, yes. Paul said so. Shall the wicked understand? Oh, no. They will attribute it to a natural cause. They will probably suppose it is two great comets coming in contact with each other. That is really fascinating that's two coming in contact. Well, yeah, especially I, if you want to talk about raining hail and all that kind of stuff. I, I, a I, comet I can, crash? <laughs> I, well, I, I don't know. It just that leads you to a lot of conjecture. Yes, it does. It will be small at first and will grow larger and larger until it will all be all in a blaze so that every eye will see it. So that's what Joseph Smith is saying about every eye being able to see it. And I think that might help with our cosmic upheaval. That, yeah. that we've got I guess coming. so, right? <laughs> so here is... Um, uh, an interesting quote that I pulled um, from the website down there at the bottom of the slide. Natural forces are unable to make hail that is as big as this is described in Revelation. The talent, it's 100 pounds. The world record for hail is 2 pounds. Right. And that's totally destructive, right? So, you know, just get a grasp of what we're talking about here. Um it's with, like the breaking up of a comet. With what is said, yes, in Revelation, that these hails, these hailstones are 100 pounds. But what about supernatural forces? Now, you can't make that hail under natural circumstances. It has to be a cataclysmic event. God used hail in the seventh plague in Egypt. There we read similar language of there was hail and fire flashing continually in the midst of the hail. Very severe, such as had not been in all the land of Egypt since it became a nation. This was no normal hail. Instead, we see this is a fire and hail cocktail hmm. created directly by God for the judgment of the Egyptians. Now, later during the conquest of Canaan, the Lord, quote, threw large stones against Israel's enemies in Joshua chapter 10. And then in Job, God says that he has, this is interesting, hail, which he has reserved for the time of distress for the day of war and battle. Wow. That's in Job chapter 38. Ezekiel records the same thing, quote, with pestilence and with blood, I will enter into judgment with him, and I will reign on him and on his troops, and on the many peoples who were, are with him, a torrential rain with hailstones, fire, and brimstone. Fascinating. In Ezekiel 38. That's an interesting take on some of these beginning of sorrows that we're seeing. And even when you consider the grand appearance to be some sort of interaction between comets. All right, and going back to the text in Matthew 24, go ahead and read the part in red. For the nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famine and pestilence and earthquakes in diverse places. And again, because of the iniquity shall abound, and the love of men shall wax cold, but he shall not be overcome. The same shall be saved. So here again. <laughs> Boy, we got a sneeze the, trade I off. know, the cough's going on. <laughs> so here again, you've got both sides of the coin. The destruction and the deliverance going on right there. And angels, and again, this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all the nations. 
And I love this because you've got that judgment coming, that end of the wor- the wicked right here that comes, where everyone is either on the right hand or on the left hand. And there it's the judgment at the beginning of the millennium. And that will always have a warning throughout Scripture. Yeah, I love this is where the clarification comes. And again shall the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet be fulfilled. Exactly. So this is a second time. Right. Here again we have the patience of the saints here that the gospel is going to be preached to all the world. And you have to remember that a lot of times the Lord will take people into captivity to get the word to a nation that wouldn't have allowed missionaries in there. There's, there's a lot of ways to bear that testimony. So in Daniel's numbers there, we have our angels going out to the four corners of the world during this time of, of warning. And that is your fifth angel in DNC 88. And then also their warning about the sheep and the goat judgment, so there, which is the one at the beginning nice of the effects, millennium. By the way. Ah, yes, thank you. Good chart, by the way. <laughs> anyway, so again, this uh, this is in Matthew 25. And uh, of course, you remember what the criteria is f- to be on the left hand or the right hand of the Lord at his return here at the Mount of Olives. The left hand ones are those that um, that when they saw someone hungry or naked during this time of tribulation, they didn't help them. Well, and it's going to be difficult, too, because provisions will be scarce. And it might be dangerous. Sure. So to help a neighbor is the widow's might with Elijah type thing. You know, yeah. Right? It's, she's it's going to sharing cost you maybe something. her last <laughs> portion or whatever. Right. And that, that's kind of the real test of just how Christ-like are you, really. Right. And you're going to see in in all of these these parables that he's talking about about this time period that we're that that the whole prophecy is about that it is all about whether you blessed other people or whether you hoarded. Yeah, it always seems to come down to your faith enough to give. Yeah. All right, so in Matthew 25, verse 41, it says, Then shall he say to those on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. So this is time out for a thousand years at this judgment for those that are on the left hand. Whereas on the right hand, they, when people were naked and starving and persecuted and they helped them right so it says then shall the king say unto them on his right hand notice the terminology here come ye blessed of my father and inherit the kingdom prepared for you he's there setting up the kingdom come and inherit it prepared from the foundation of the world so this this period of time this tribulation this wrath is a testing ground absolutely in uh, next verses that we want to kind of pay attention to is verse 35. It says that although the days will come that heaven and earth will pass away, my words shall not pass away, but shall all be fulfilled. So what, what's he talking about when he says the days will come that heaven and earth will pass away? I kind of lean towards in the millennium on that for me. Exactly, and, and that's, that's what you see. The elements melt. There. Yeah, they're... this is a this is a end of the seven thousand years scenario here. So again, I love this verse right here. It says, "Look up and lift up your heads, for the day of your redemption draweth nigh." Yeah. And I I just love that. And again, here's your verse in D and C one thirty that talks about this process of a new heaven and a new earth. The angels do not reside on a planet like this earth, but they reside in the presence of God on a globe like sea of glass and fire, where all things for their glory are manifest, past, present, and future, and are continually before the Lord. The place where God resides is a great Urim and Thummim. Yes, I was going to say, it's like a 
like a sapphire stone is the way it's also described. Was the floor at, at, right. at Mount Sinai, right? Um, and in Ezekiel's throne room. This earth in its sanctified and immortal state will be made like unto crystal and will be a Urim and Thummim. So it's, this is its celestialization process. This is when I, I love, when I, when I think of dirt and earth melting down into crystal, you know, that I can see why they say the elements melt with fervent heat. So again, this is a new heaven and a new earth whereby all things pertaining to an inferior kingdom or all kingdoms of a lower order will be manifest to those who dwell on it. And the earth will be Christ's. So that that's an excited. That's that's the happy side of a new heaven and a new earth. But if you're wicked, I guess that means you got to go somewhere else, right? Okay. And now we're in verse thirty-one. And whoso treasureth up my words shall not be deceived, for the Son of Man shall come. Shall. This is right not, on time in yeah, the due right time. On, in the due time, right? And you know, a, a lot of people think, well, you, well, if even the very elect will be deceived, how do you not be deceived? Well, there you have it. Treasure so up the treasures words. up my words. Exactly. Will not be deceived. I just love that. All right, and then we have again the parable of the fig tree, and it says that. Um, go ahead and read the parable of the fig tree. When its branches are yet tender, and it bringeth to put forth leaves, ye shall know that summer is at hand. So yeah. likewise, my elect, when they shall see these things, they shall know that he is near even at the door. Now, I don't know about everybody else. There's the leaves again in the see. summertime. But of that day and hour, no man knoweth, not even the angels, God in heaven, but my Father only. That was then. He actually said that later in a different quote to Joseph Smith. Well, we have that coming up, but I, I want to pay attention to both of those. Number one, I want to talk about the leaves again. We talked about it a little bit last time in our last lesson, but I'm going to focus in on this again because it's I, important. I, rem I remember a conversation I had with a dear fr um, friend that was a Christian, and they were a little befuddled by the fact that the father only. Oh, we, uh, we're jumping back and forth here between the fig tree <laughs> and the day and the hour that no man knows, save the Father only. But we're actually going to hit them both. Okay. So let, let's jump in and do it. Um, again, we're going to go to DNC 45, and we're going to notice a couple of linking words here. And again, I say, hearken unto my voice, lest death shall overtake you in an hour when you think not. What is the hour? Seven years. It's that hour of judgment yeah. right daniel's hour of judgment when you think not the summer will be passed well wait a minute and the wheat the, harvest that's will be the wheat harvest is going to be passed and the harvest ended and your souls, souls not saved. not saved. that's kind of pointed straight at the gentiles from ouch the, yeah. right all right and when the light shall begin to break forth it shall be um with them like unto a parable which i will show you Look and behold the fig trees. So again, yeah. we have the fig tree parable. And then you see that here at the restoration in DSC 45, the leaves are beginning to shoot forth. It's summertime. It's the okay? end of summer. Actually. It's actually the end of summertime because we're getting the gospel, the restoration of the gospel. So the leaves are coming back on the tree. Okay. Even so, shall it be in the day when you see these things, they shall know that the hour is nigh. The hour is nigh. And, you know, DNC 88 says, after your testimony, the missionaries going out at the time of Joseph Smith, comes the testimonies of thunders and lightnings and all of those beginnings of sorrows. Right. Okay. And it shall come to pass that he that feareth me shall be looking forth for the great day of the Lord to come and the signs of the coming of the Son of Man. Okay. So let's... Uh, there goes my wheat, wheat harvest. harvest. Saw some of them, 50% of them repented. I was going to say, I hope that was the tares burning up. On the <laughs> no, 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 those were both wheat. Actually, you remember that 50% of the Gentiles join the harlot and burn with the tares. All right, so here's just help a little help with the hour of judgment if people don't believe me. Um, it says in Revelation 18, alas, alas, that great city Babylon 
one hour your judgment is come for in one hour so great riches is come to naught and they cast dust on their heads and cried weeping and wailing saying ah oh, the great city in one hour she is made desolate so, yeah, I know a lot of people that say that that is an actual 60-minute hour. It probably is. And I would say, yes. 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 Yeah, and <laughs> I like about, that. Yes. yes. <laughs> yeah. A, a okay. culminating event. A culminating event. Absolutely. Yeah, it's kind of a, like it's a uh, boom, and it exactly. just hones in on this moment. But it's very time. directly connected yes. to the fall of Babylon there. All right, so let's hit the day and the hour no man knows. Because, you know, you, you said in your last video you get a lot of people asking you about, you know, wait a minute, well, Sunday can't be the yeah. right Saturday. Or, or Sunday oh, can't be the right I Sabbath day. And, I, and I, the question I always get is, wait a minute, nobody knows the day and the hour, right? Yeah. So in Matthew 24, so likewise when you shall see all of these things that we've been talking about, know that it is near, even at the doors. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass that seeing the generation that's seeing all these signs shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled heaven and earth shall pass away but my words will not pass away but of the day and the hour knoweth no man no not the angels of heaven but my father only so how can how can we know some well, of the timing of Daniel's numbers. Well, number one, you got to realize that that's also the terminology for trumpets, the day and the hour no man knoweth, because yes. it's a witness to them. We'll actually talk about that. But in just here's a here's my point: until you shall see the signs. Now, most of us don't recognize the signs, but the the signs are happening, and it's very precise and it's very on time and very focused. And I'm, I guess where I'm going with that is that what is that moment that you recognize it? Is it when you first see the sign of his coming? Or is it when he actually sets foot on the Mount of Olives? Because obviously Joseph Smith said comets would come. Obviously that's a lead. What I'm saying is there's so many pointers that are leading into this razor's edge. So you might ask, what is the moment you see? Is coming. So, I, I like what you're saying, but I'm, I'm going to go with that there are different ways to look at the day and the hour that no man knows. Okay? Number one, if Daniel's numbers are pointing to something, then those things that Daniel's numbers are pointing to is not the day or the hour that no man knows. Kind of a no-brainer. Right? right, because the angel Gabriel told Daniel, told them they'd figure it out in the last days, and they point to a day. Right. So obviously, that's not the day that this is talking about. Okay. Or not the way it was talking right. about, at least. And you've brought out the point that the day of trumpets is actually called the day in the hour that no man knows, which is kind of a clue that that it would be like the day of trumpets. You'd be looking for his coming. And when and, you see the sign. And when you see it. But you know generally when to look, right? Right. Okay. But um, so we're looking for the coming of the Savior at a time when nobody knows. And we know that one of those areas is trumpets, but there's another hidden day. Okay? The day of trumpets is actually called Yom Hakesha. Which Hakesa, which is the hidden day, but that is also a reference to the coming of the bridegroom. Yeah, in the story. And I'm going to I'm going to to give my my theory here that I believe that the day and the hour that no man knows is his coming as the bridegroom in glory. That's not Adam on day Amen. in D and C eighty eight. It says that's when his face is unveiled. It's not at the Mount of Olives because, be, well, number one, we know that Daniel's numbers both point to Adam and Diamond and the Mount of Olives. But it's not the Mount of Olives because I think that would be a horrific type and shadow if the bridegroom comes to the wedding dressed in blood and, and right. annihilating in vengeance the nations at Armageddon. I mean, that's not the bridegroom. That's, that's not the imagery there at his coming on the Mount of Olives. It's going to be 
for the Feast of Tabernacles when he comes as the bridegroom. The Feast of Tabernacles represents the wedding feast. And that is five days after the Day of Atonement, which would be the Mount of Olives. And that five days could be an increment of five of something, right? We kind of learned with Daniel's numbers that, that you can have five years, you can have five Shemitahs, which is groups of seven years, you can have five. So again, in Hebrew, it's absolutely legitimate to have that five day period between atonement and tabernacles represent an interval of five of something. Right. Okay, my my guess in the end time is being as the seven year tribulation was a day to a year, like it said in Second Esdras, it might be a five year interval, but it's a day in the hour that no man knows because as you notice on our timeline, Daniel's numbers do not point to the Feast of Tabernacles. Right. Absolutely. They no. point to the Day of Atonement and to the Day of Trumpets. All right, so Yom Hakesa, the hidden day. Once the bride and the bridegroom are betrothed, legally and formally committed to marry, as on Mount Sinai, it is then becomes the groom's task to go to his father's house and prepare a place for her. From the time of the bridegroom's departure until he returns for her a year or so later, the bride placed a lamp or a candle in her window and kept it continually burning every night. I hope your, your brain is just going crazy here because the bride it has a lamp or a candle. I hope you're getting ten virgins here and lamps or candles waiting for the bridegroom and that... Um, Five and, are ready, five aren't. Yeah, and, and that they're they're waiting for his coming. And that, you know, Jesus said, I go and prepare a place for you. You know, he's, this is why we. He's preparing a place for the bride. We, we were excited when we saw that the stars were actually doing a dance of a Hebrew wedding. Because there's so much of this bridegroom imagery. wedding imagery. It's also the imagery of the Feast of Tabernacles, like we said. It was a token of her faithfulness, and she lived for the day her beloved would suddenly return for her. This is how Hebrew weddings go. Nevertheless, this is actually from one of my favorite books called The Beloved Bridegroom by Donna Nielsen. Nevertheless, the bridegroom could only return for his bride after his father had approved his son's new home and declared that the preparations were finished, as described below. This was done under the supervision of his father. It was often attached to a family compound where several other families also lived. When the father gave his approval of the new dwelling, the bridegroom could go and get his new bride and begin bring her to his father's house. The father was the one who determined when it was ready, when it was time. And I, I love um, what, what was stated in the Visions of Glory what, at, at the end when they said that they're all watching for the coming of, of Christ. And they didn't know when, but they, but they knew it was coming soon. And the reason they knew it is because they knew that every last person that could be saved and brought in to the city of Jerusalem was saved right. and brought in that they had completed the work, and only the Father knew when that time would be. And again, it's encapsulated here in the Hebrew wedding imagery. This is Jesus say, giving this imagery as, as he ascends into heaven. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, or kingdoms that he's preparing right. for us. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. But of the day and the hour when the bridegroom will return, knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. So the coming of the bridegroom is pictured in the end time day of trumpets, and in the ancient Hebrew wedding traditions, and it is the day and the hour that no one knoweth. This is the day for which there is no appointment, for that day and hour is subject only to the Father's call when he alone determines the preparations are finished 
and ready to receive his bride. And and I love that because you can go through the scriptures and you can see that there are so many end time prophecies that are that are going to happen in the due time of the Lord. Right. But never the coming of the bridegroom. This is the familiar quote you that you read often. Go ahead and read it for those who haven't heard it from Joseph Smith. Christ says, No man know the day or the hour when the Son of Man cometh, Matthew twenty four thirty six. Did Christ speak this in general principle throughout all generations? Oh no. He spoke in the present tense. No man that was then living knew the day or the hour. But he did not say that there was no man throughout all the generations that should not know the day or the hour. For this would be in flat contradiction with the other scriptures of the prophets, says that God will do nothing but what he revealed to his servants, the prophets. So again, <clears throat> there, there's a lot of layers to understanding what Jesus meant by the day and the hour that no man knows. Now again, we see our angels going out, and there we see at the end when everyone has been told of the coming kingdom and the destructions and judgments that are on on the event stage we have jesus is coming at the mount of olives which brings the sheep and goat judgment that's the beginning of the millennium and then there on that timeline you can see the numbers one two three four five those numbers just represent some interval of five that is the difference between the atonement and the day of atonement and the Feast of Tabernacles, which is the coming of the bridegroom to the wedding supper, as pictured on our charts there. As we end the, the Matthew 24, we are going to have the statements that there is there are two, and, and one shall be in the field, and one will be taken, and the other is left. And then there, there are two women grinding at the mill, and one is taken, and the other is left. And then we had the parable in Matthew 25 of the ten virgins we had five that were foolish and five that were wise and like we've said before there's a common denominator at this judgment time that in the wheat harvest the time of the gentiles harvest of those that said that they were his bride 50 percent of them stay true and 50 percent of them join with the harlot babylon or in the words of nephi um, the church of the devil and then we're told to watch, therefore, for... You know not the, what hour your Lord doth come. Right. All right. And then, again, we're told that it, he's coming as a thief in the night. Of course, this is kind of like the wrath. He's God's wrath in, in their times, hand. Yeah. Well, he's also that thief that's coming at the same time that the Lord will come. He's a marker of the coming of the Lord, that Antichrist figure, that time of wrath and tribulation that is prophesied. And then at the very end of Matthew 24, we have the parable of the 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 wise servant and the wicked servant. And we've talked about it before, that the wicked servant isn't just wicked, but he persecutes the righteous ones. And so again, we have this end time dichotomy this polarization of two different two ways two churches only two concept. churches only right here in first nephi 1410 and he said unto me behold there are saved two churches only the one is the church of the lamb of god i love the way it identifies it as the lamb of god and the other is the church of the devil wherefore whoso belongeth not to the church to of the, the lamb church of god. the lamb is but automatically part of the other and in this polarization period, you won't just get to ride along. You'll have to join with the harlot Babylon's persecution or choking of the wheat right. in that end time testing period there. And then as we move into Matthew 25, we've kind of already picked up the sheep and the goats. We've picked up the parable of the ten virgins. But we're going to now cover just one last parable that's in Matthew 25, which is the parable of the talents. And, of course, again, here I, I think this applies on so many levels. It applies to our families. It applies to our finances. It applies to anything that the Lord has given us as a stewardship and he expects us to use our probationary time here 
to use our stewardship to bless others. This is all in the same context as the sheep and the ghost. Did you feed them? Did you clothe them? Did you help them? In all of these parables, it's were, were you the wicked steward or were you the wise steward? Did you help your fellow man or did you persecute your fellow man? And the same thing is happening with these talents, with the resources that God has given you. Did you use them to increase and to bless? We could tear it apart, but I, I really feel like this is the deep meaning behind it. And I'll, I'll show you why. Because look at the very end. What happens to the one who hoarded? The one who just saved it away because he was saved afraid. Saved it away and buried it. It doesn't matter if you hoarded it because you were afraid. <laughs> this is, I'm, I'm sorry, we're, we're, we're getting a little... Pointed. pointed here with with the the context that these parables are being given in and um the very last verse says and his lord shall say unto his servants cast ye the unprofitable servant into outer darkness where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth right now that's a very fascinating phrase because, you know, I've heard people say, well, outer darkness is perdition or, or something like that. And, and you know, I, I, don't perhaps, think that, I don't think that perhaps that's... you could reason that out in one way, but this is not really. Yeah, yeah this is not that's really... kind of harsh for, for burying your talent, you know. Um, but if you do the scriptural cross referencing for outer darkness, you're going to find something pretty interesting. And there's a lot of verses, but I'm just going to do one. We're going to go to Isaiah chapter 8 and watch this. So I, to, to preface this, I want to I wanna remind you that in Revelation 9, in the end time, that there's these evil spirits that are kind of released in this end time tribulation. It's like all the forces of good yeah. and evil are coming to the stage here. And, in that and it seems so as we look. And it's just the beginning. Even right now, right? That's what I say. And it's just the beginning. And and look at this. It, it talks about men that are communicating with evil spirits here. And it says, Should one inquire of the dead on behalf of the living for doctrine and for testimony? What are you thinking? Right. And then he says, Surely while they utter such words devoid of light... They roam about embittered by hunger, and when they are hungry, they become enraged, and gazing upward, curse their God and king. And then look what happens here. To those that are mingling with these evil spirits in the time of, it says, of tribulation, they will look to the land, but there shall be a depressing scene of anguish and gloom, and thus they are banished into outer darkness. Hmm. They look to the land. You can do a lot of cross-referencing, but I would maintain that one level of being cast into outer darkness is being cast into this time of the Great Tribulation, the time of wrath. And I kind of like that description, but I also find it interesting. And it fits the land, with what's going on. They look to the land means they're kind of looking for mother nature to fix everything perhaps or interesting but, but it's, it's desolation yeah and, but and it's clean. desolation so it's like oh that's despair and banished and so another reason that we get that it's during this time of this outer darkness is the time of this tribulation is because one of the code names for the king of wrath. assyria is darkness he and is wrath. wrath he is and you're being cast out dude those that are elect those that love the lord in isaiah they come they gather to zion they're rescued by the 144,000. but those that do not have that faith those that fear those that hoard they are left in the outer darkness, in that time period of the wrath. Don't forget that in uh, Thessalonians, Paul says, my people are not destined for, their, for the wrath. 
You're right. saved out of it. Remember that there's judgment, but there's deliverance for those who will be delivered. DNC 88. For those who will clothe the hungry, feed the poor. Another alternate ending. <laughs> there you go, yes. All right, so this is what I want to end on. Remember we talked about this time period of the, of the wheat harvest when, you know, the Gentiles kind of split 50-50 here. This is one of my favorites in Ruth. You know that... Um, Naomi represents Israel, and Ruth and Orpah are the two daughters from the Gentiles, but they split 50-50, right? Yeah. But knowing that, that this is the case, and that Ruth is, represents the Gentiles that love the Lord, that stay faithful to Him. She's the virgin that has oil in her lamp, and she comes into the wedding supper. Okay, let's go ahead and read some things from Ruth chapter 2. Boaz being a type of the kinsman redeemer of Jesus Christ. Notice that the context is a harvest here and that there are reapers. And Boaz says, the Lord be with you and bless thee. And then Boaz said unto his servant that was over the reapers, who is this? Who is this Gentile woman? Who is this damsel? And the servant that was set over the reapers answered and said, it is a Moabitess. Skipping down for time, then said Boaz unto Ruth, Harvest thou not my daughter? Hearest. He, I'm sorry, hearest thou not my daughter? Go not to glean in another field. Don't go back to Moab. Come to Israel. He says, Go with not to glean in another field, neither go from hence, but abide here fast by my maidens. And let thine eyes be on the field that they do reap and go after them. Um, going down to the end here, I, I just love that Boaz tells her, the Lord recompense thy work, and a full reward be given thee of the Lord God of Israel, under whose wings thou hast art come to trust. Which is... And I just hope... An admission, I mean, admonition to us. Come and trust. To be kings and queens of the Gentiles. And if you notice in the story of Ruth, she doesn't just go to Israel. She blesses Naomi and saves Naomi's inheritance. This is a magnificent parable. This is a magnificent parable. It's a magnificent story. call For to us. you and to me to be kings and queens of the Gentiles. To be part of the restoration of Israel that Joseph Smith laid the foundation for as it comes to its grand finale. And all of these parables, all of these prophecies in Matthew 24 and 25 are about this end time scenario. And with that, be faithful. trust in Him, find faith, believe and prepare. Oh, it's prepare just so delicious. Yes. <laughs> I love the scriptures. Till next time. Matthew 26. Hiya. Mm -hmm.